such as why does glue not stick to the inside of the bottle? Why does sun lighten hair but darken skin? That's, that's actually a pretty good question. For anyone like me who spends a lot of their life on a computer in a Windows operating system, why do we turn it off by hitting the start button? Somebody wondered, why can you not find mouse-flavored cat food? How about this one? Why do we invest our money with somebody called a broker? That was actually a really good question. How about this one? We were talking about the 23rd Psalm in my Sunday school class with the kids today. We were talking about God being our shepherd. Well, if we're thinking about sheep, how come when sheep are outside in the rain, they don't shrink? Or how about this one? This one was really, this one really made me stop and think and smile. A question about a gentleman who gets married and dies without children. So the woman marries again, dies again without children, marries again. Happened seven times. Well, who is she married to in heaven? How's that for a crazy question? It's what we call an absurdist question. You run across absurdist questions every once in a while, sometimes in, in the idea of church, and it's a type of question that is meant to stump because the question is so absurd, its answer sounds kind of ridiculous almost. Some of the other examples of things that I've gotten questioned about over the years, if, if can God create something more powerful than himself? That's an absurdist question. It's not meant to degrade the question, but it's, in the end, does the question really matter? Or how about this one? This, this was, you may look at this question and say, this was really dumb, but in the Middle Ages, people actually spent incredible amounts of time debating this and actually writing books about this, and that's, how many angels could you put on the head of a pen? Does it really matter in the end? Some people have even asked me, did Adam have a belly button? Hmm. Does it matter? The churches have actually worried about such things. Who cares in the end? Last week we came to a passage about taxes, where they come up to Jesus and say, it's a right to pay taxes to Caesar. We don't like Caesar, and we really don't like paying taxes. Can we get out of it? And Jesus says, do you know what? In the light of all of eternity, do taxes matter? Does the tax rate you pay today, is it going to matter in a million years? When you stood before the throne of God, do you really think how much taxes you paid is going to matter? Now he's not saying we should not care about tax, but he's saying, do you know what, in the end, this is not something to get all bent out of shape about. <clears throat> this is kind of the answer to this week's little quandary as well. In the light of God and eternity, this question that these Sadducees are coming up and asking, do you know what? It's going to work itself out. It really is secondary to the love and the power of Jesus Christ. And all these things, they come expecting that Jesus is going to answer a certain way. And the tax question... Half of them are hoping he says no, because then they get arrested for trying to encourage people not to pay taxes. The other half is hoping he says, yes, you should pay your taxes, because they're going to discredit him in front of the people. Jesus gives them an unexpected answer. This week they come to Jesus, hoping to trap him on a theological quandary of an absurd question. And he gets out of it in a very logical way, in a way that brings them back to Jesus. And it's an unexpected answer. We're going to talk 
through Advent, through the month of December, the end of November, beginning of December, about the fact that in a lot of ways, Jesus comes and does the unexpected. In your bulletin this week, there's an insert. It's a one-page insert. Take it home. Look at it sometime. Uh, because on it are some readings that I'm hoping that people are going to do uh, to prepare themselves for the message. I've said this before. You put a little work into it beforehand, you're going to get more out of the sermons. You come prayerfully. You come prepared, having read the scripture. I promise you, you're going to get more out of it. It's like anything in life. Take time. Read the scriptures. And prepare your heart, because we're going to talk about how Jesus came in an unexpected way. And the Sadducees certainly expected the Messiah was going to come in an expected way. And he breaks their expectations. Do you know what? We've heard the Christmas message so many times that uh, we're going to do something a little bit different for our sermons through, the, through Advent. To try to get us to hear it in a new light. And I'm going to explain a little bit about how we're going to do that next week. But we're going to try to break our expectations. Here, we've got this group called the Sadducees. They are powerful. They're rich. They are well educated. And they're highly unpopular with the people. The Pharisees, people like them. Sadducees, they were theologically kind of their enemies. They tended to work with the Roman authorities a little bit. They tended to uh, like their prestige and their power. They like being powerful. And sometimes to be powerful, you have to push down those who are below you. And so they tended to do that. We read a lot about the Pharisees in the Gospels. We don't read as much about the Sadducees. They're actually more powerful than the Pharisees but a lot less popular. They have some strange theological ideas. They did not accept the entire Old Testament as scripture. They only liked the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And if you just read those, ver those books of the uh, Old Testament, they didn't read a lot about life after death. That's not the focus of those books. So they would go around and say, what happens in this world is all that matters. Money, power, prestige. You might as well chase after them because if there's no life after death. And all that matters is this life. Well, I might as well get all that I can. And obviously, if I've got power, that they did, like they did, if I've got riches, like they did, obviously that's God's blessing, right? Because God's blessing comes in this life, and all that matters is I got money now. That's what they believed. So we start have to start with talking about their wrong ideas. I'm going to put up the main verse, I think, the main portion of this passage. And it's at the end where Jesus says, I am the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are quite wrong. Let's talk about that wrong ideas. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. None of the rulers of this age understood this. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, no I have seen, no ear heard, no heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. What the bottom line is? They didn't know God. They didn't understand what was going on. And because they didn't understand, they didn't see that God had something even better for them than they can imagine. The best they can imagine was God had money and power for them. Do you know what? On this world, sometimes that's the best we can see. God had something better. They couldn't even 
even imagine what God had for them. I'm going to tell you, none of us fully understand. You read through some of the other cultures and religious groups around the world. Now, if you go look at what uh, the native people around our parts believed before the church came into their into their culture, they believed they went off to, to these great hunting grounds. And what, what did eternity look like? It was really good hunting. If you, uh, our community was founded by the descendants of the Vikings, you look at Viking culture, what did they think of the afterlife? Look at Valhalla. It was a place where you could go and battle and fight all the time. You look at Islamic culture today, kind of, you read their accounts of heaven, it almost sounds like an oasis in the desert. Do you mind? They're Arabs, a desert place. What, what is all this? The idea of the afterlife is kind of like today, but better. It's kind of like just things work out a little bit better, but it looks like our world. Christians in the Middle Ages started to come up with equally kind of interesting ideas. They started to picture heaven being kind of cloud-like, a beautiful, perfect, sunny day. And that kind of eventually turned into sitting on clouds. There was good music. There was good food. That was, that was, that was kind of their idea. It was what they could imagine. So they would sit on clouds and play harps. And that, that sounds pretty good. And interestingly enough, what does hell become in the minds of the medieval church? Scary, monster-like creatures dressed in red with pointy tails and horns who torture you all day long, and it starts to look like a medieval torture chamber. Where do we get that from? Both their, the medieval ideas of heaven and hell come from what we want and what we don't want. It starts to come from our imagination. The Sadducees were equally unbiblical. The Sadducees' idea is this world was all we have. Go after wealth. That's God's blessing. Am I powerful? God loves me, and that's what matters. Tomorrow does not. I'm going to tell you something. God has something much different. We're not going to so much get into hell, but I'm going to tell you this idea that the medieval church had is wrong. It is not some place where all the bad guys get together and, well, they can do whatever they want because God's not watching anymore, but occasionally have to endure a little bit of torture. That's not hell. Hell is something very different. It is much lonelier. It is something where we are in isolation. And it is something that is very real. But our main focus today is going to be on the better end of eternity. Because that's where Jesus is going to take us in this story. And that's, heaven is something that is much better than we can possibly imagine. So let's talk about the right ideas. Why does Jesus quote this verse if he wants to prove the afterlife? I'm the God of Abraham. It's this whole idea of I am, that I exist, that I create life. And the reason why he chooses this is it, become, is it comes from that part of the Bible that the Sadducees did accept. This is from the book of Exodus. So he brings them to the book of Exodus, and he shows them that God is not about death. God is about life. He's about death reversed. Our final spot our final place is something called the resurrection. And when I say final, that means the end. I mean it's actually more the beginning. Because our life in the resurrection is much longer than anything on this earth. We may die, and we may meet God in the, in the clouds, and that's part of where this whole cloud thing comes up. We may meet him in the clouds as if we don't die by the time he returns. 
The point with whatever is we will stand before the throne of God someday, and God will recreate the world as he meant it to be in a way that is unimaginable. I'm going to take us to a couple of scriptures, whole chapters. I'm not going to read the whole chapters, but if you'd like to follow along, I invite you to turn, first of all, to 1 Corinthians 15. I am going to mostly walk us through scriptures today. The reason for that is quite simple. I have often been told and read and heard that if you want to affect a preaching, you need to preach what you know. Guess what? I've never died before. I don't know what it's going to be like fully. I have never stood before the throne of God. I have never stood in eternity all I can base it on are these words. The words of the God who knows it. So if we want to understand what the future holds, we have to come to this book. We don't have a choice. Listen to these words out of 1 Corinthians 15. I'm going to start reading verse 3. For what I passed on to you as a first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter, and then to the twelve, after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living. Of course, at that time when he wrote this. Though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and to all the apostles, and last of all he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. We're going to stop there for a minute. It's clear. Here's Jesus. And now this is true. Where he's going to go from here in the rest of the chapter is how can we say the resurrection of the dead is impossible if Jesus has already been raised from the dead? And if Christ has not been raised from the dead, your faith is useless to you. In fact, he's going to go on. He's going to call faith without the resurrection futile. That's his word. It's futile. But Christ did rise. First fruit of all who died. We've had sin and death since Adam. But go down to verse 24. Then the end will come. When he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he's destroyed all dominion, authority, and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For he has put everything under his feet. This phenomenal concept. And how is this going to work? We will be raised different than the body that dies. The body that will stand in eternity will be imperishable with glory raised in power. What does that mean? I don't know. I know some things that it isn't. It's not filled with sickness and failure and injury. I don't know exactly how it's going to look, but but what Paul is describing that the Holy Spirit is told is that something great is our future. That's our perspective. What will our bodies look like? Don't panic about it. It will resemble ours. There's obviously flesh involved because he compares it. He compares it with diet. It's like a seed and the seed grows. It's got to come from the same idea. But God is a work. That's the main idea. Go to the end of the chapter. Verse 50. I declare to you, brothers, the flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I will tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. 
For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable is clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? over to the very end of the Bible almost, Revelation 21. Listen to this from Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now, the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. <coughs> Revelation 21 continues to go on saying that we've got a powerful God who has created this new place, and those who overcome will inherit it. John watches, and, and, and he's, he's told, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Now hang on to that thought for a second, because we're going to come back to that, the wife of the Lamb. Hey, John, John sees Jerusalem coming down. But it's nothing like the Jerusalem that he knew. It's a massive city beyond our comprehension with beauty that we cannot even begin to describe. He tries to come up with ways to describe it. It doesn't work because it's way more beautiful than anything John can possibly imagine. God himself will be present in the city. When it talks about no need for a temple, it's because the temple was a place you went to be. God God's everywhere there. God's everywhere there. In fact, there's no need for light, it says, because God himself will physically be the light for this city. God himself who is present, and who is the bride of the king of this city? The church. God's church. Which leads us back to our passage and something about marriage. There are all sorts of ways that heaven could become a very awkward place, isn't there? Beyond this, you've got a husband and wife that do break up, become exes. Well, a lot of people don't want to see their exes in heaven. I mean, honestly, right? There might be people that you've embarrassed yourself in front of that you say, I don't know that I want to spend eternity explaining myself. I may have made a mistake and offended somebody. Are they going to be offended in heaven? Am I going to spend eternity trying to explain my, off, my offenses? That doesn't sound like eternity. I don't think eternity is going to be awkward like that. Do you? That's what the Sadducees are coming asking. So if you've got people there and you've got an awkward situation, what's going to happen? Is this going to be an awkward place? We're all going to be trying to figure out what to say. This world will not be forgotten. I was reading the words of Amy Carmichael this this week. She was a missionary, oh, what, about 150 years ago, something like that. She uh, wrote some incredible books of depths of scriptural life, and she said, you know what, we're going to be like Jesus there. 
And what is Jesus all about? Jesus is about relationships. And Jesus remembers who we are. He remembers, but he doesn't remember our sin. Maybe that's what it's going to be really like. Where we remember our relationships, our relationships are deepened. They're made to be more like what God intended them to be. But the painful part's gone. The painful part is gone. Ephesians chapter 5. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. You may know that passage. Husband and wife. Now here's something incredible. This mystery, and this is the next verse, this mystery is profound. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. We've already seen in Revelations that the Lamb is married to the church. The Lamb is Jesus. There will be be marriage in heaven. But not like how we think of it. Marriage today is a way to put structure to the most important relationship that we have in this world. Marriage is going to be very different in heaven because the most important relationship is going to be us and Jesus. We will be married to him. Does that mean that the relationships on this earth are gone? Not at all. I was reading a book called Heaven by Randy Alcorn as I was preparing for this week's sermon. It is a great book. It's actually in our church library. If you have questions about heaven, it doesn't figure them all out, but it answers a lot of great questions. And he's, he writes in this book, he says, do you know what? I think I'm going to know my family now. And I think he's bang on right. I'm going to know my wife. In fact, I, he says, I bet I know my wife better there than I do now. Because the, union, the things in our union that keep us separated will be gone. I will know we're much better there. But my focus is going to be on Jesus. My focus is going to be on the God who stands before me. The God of love. The God of the universe. And the things that don't matter are going to fall away in the presence of Jesus. And he goes on to write and says, I'm going to know my kids better. They're going to know me better. But it isn't going to be the same kind of relationship because that relationship won't matter because I'm going to be the son of God and they're going to be the sons and daughters of God. And that's what's going to matter. Everything else falls away before the beauty and the love of Jesus Christ. We're going to live in a perfect world where God's holiness has made a right. The marriage will no longer be the framework of society, but we're going to be even closer to those we love. So let's talk about what the real point of Jesus' message is, and it's this word, living or life. That's the point. A lot of people, one time you can get them into churches for funerals. Unfortunately, it might seem that the church is about death. But I'm going to tell you, the church is all about life. Jesus comes. What does he say up here? I'm the way, the truth, life. This is not long after he said in the Gospel of John, I am the resurrection and the life. He says, I am life. That's who I am. That's my name. We don't wait for death. Life is a part. God created life, not death. Death is something that we as humans introduce to the world through sin. God wants life. Death is the absence of life. That is not God's created order. Not just in the sense of living forever, but living as God intended us to live, following God, living God's very life, the life he created us for. It is trading in our old, sinful, selfish life and exchanging it for the life of the living God. 
That's what it's all about. These Sadducees who are coming along, what did they think it was all about? They certainly thought Christianity was about getting what you wanted from God. That's not the point. Last week, the Pharisees came along and challenged Jesus. What did they think it was all about? Christianity was all about rules. That's what they wanted. That's not what Christianity is all about. The Pharisees in our passage last week came up with the Herodians, a group that along with their allies, the Romans, thought it should all be about rules and order and control. That's not what Christianity is all about. It is about the fullness of life. That's what Jesus wanted. Jesus breaks our expectations at every turn and creates something new and powerful, and that's what he wants for us. And if we are the overcomers, as it says in Revelation 21, if we are the ones who stand with him, if we are the ones who follow his life, we have an eternity to stand before the beauty of God and let the problems of this world melt away. Because that's the point of it. Living the life of Jesus. That's our hope. So I'm going to invite us to finish our sermon by singing hymn number 291.